All right, so uh, time uh, begins at the beginning. What the beginning is, however, is not given in time, and so in consequence we must ask what happened before there was time, which is a temporal category. So what happened before there was time is a plausible question, only if there is time already. But the readiness of time begs the question. I think that we can't start with the metaphysics of time. We have to start with the logic of time. This is to say that we need to ask the question, what does time mean, before we can ask the question, what is time? Uh, well, there's, there's history as well. And the history is here in my very presentation to you because the technology that I'm speaking to you through isn't fully effective. I don't have the correct application. So the image quality is partly a technical limitation, but it's also an effect of the historical distance between us. Technology is historicized, and history is organized through technology. I think this is one of the things that's central to the film. So the film presents a disruption of linear time and also of the inexorability of time. So in order to kind of actually introduce logic into time, it's necessary to get rid of this idea of, of, of truth preservation. And, and when you do that, uh, logic becomes much more interesting because it becomes much more about how one reasons in the world or how one conceptually navigates the world. Um, I'm uh, doing a PhD at Columbia University and um, I'm very interested in the question of, uh, of neutrality as a different alternative to uh, the question of universality in a way and how those, the, the way in which this dynamic of universality as a telos of the project of the Enlightenment. Well, I'm really interested in what an accelerationist feminism might look like, or an accelerationist politics of sexuality. I think that it's kind of quite widely perceived accelerationism as being quite masculinist. You know, there, there's been a lot of criticism of the manifesto form as being quite sort of thrusting, quite masculine, and there is a, a widespread perception that as a sort of clustering of ideas is not very hospitable to women. Um, that's something that I kind of have never really felt or registered myself and I'm quite interested in taking what accelerationism can give me and using it as the basis of um, uh, developing a feminist politics. So I'm Nick Cernick, uh, I'm a co-author along with Alex Williams of uh, the Accelerationist Manifesto, uh, which is really this attempt to sort of diagnose some of the problems within the contemporary left uh, one of the internal sort of reasons why the left has failed over the past uh, few decades. Uh, and in its place, the attempt to sort of set uh, what we call an acceleration of politics, uh, which is really this attempt to recover uh, the idea of the future, the idea of progress, and the idea of modernity as a sort of grand overarching narrative. Okay, hi. Uh, my name's Benedict Singleton. I'm a strategist based in London. Uh, my background is in design and philosophy, um, which I guess is what led me to be here in some way or another. Um, so I've been working in design for quite a long time and I ended up um, basically working a lot in, in kind of emerging areas of design, so designing services and organizations and this kind of thing, um, uh, which is how I ended up kind of meeting all the people involved in accelerationism. Within a reflexive model, you always have like one reflection over the next, over the next, this kind of meta, meta, meta reflexivity, whereas uh, recursion always means that you integrate a part into a whole, both changing the part and the whole. So some apparently tautological sentences like, and I take an example from literature, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose, that's often quoted wrongly, it's four roses, and that's, I think, important. A beautiful extreme, that's how it continues. We were thinking a lot about why is it four roses and why beautiful extreme and why does Gertrude Stein 15 years later say this is the first time in 150 years of English literature that the rose was really red. You really do get the sense that there's like a, some call, sort of slow social, socio-cultural shift going on and that actually people in all these different disciplines and different backgrounds, I mean, mine really couldn't be more different than like a philosopher of mathematics or something. 
Like, but nonetheless, people have seemed to um, kind of be picking up on the same things, on the same like general uh, conditions which need to be addressed. I think capitalism functions by accelerating its processes and its technologies. Um, I don't think that that critique or protest can effectively resist or oppose that acceleration. So I'm interested in uh, the political horizons of intensifying rather than resisting platforms of capitalization. We have plenty of dystopian visions, uh, but we've lost the sort of sense there could actually be a better future. Uh, so a major part of our work is to try and um, rethink these sorts of ideas uh, without making it just a sort of abstract utopia, uh, really a sort of concrete utopia uh, that plays upon existing tendencies in the world uh, and elaborates what a potential future could be on the basis of these tendencies. The relationship between the film and the summer school has become the primary case study for what hyperstition is. The summer school's thematization of hyperstition in fact ended up with a film called Hyperstition, which was its future. The film was not in place at the time, but in a way became a retroactive reorganization of what the summer school is, and in fact even what we now understand to be the primary image, the narrative that we have of the summer school survives more through the film than through anything else. So hyperstition was affected. It wasn't just discussed. It wasn't just the object of discussion. It was, in fact, the very praxis of the summer school qua film. But this, again, reveals something or crystallizes something uh, fundamental about the complexity of hyperstition, which goes all the way back to its um, identification and designation by kind of Landian accelerationism in the 90s and 2000s, which is hyperstition is the fundamental mechanism of contemporary capitalism. is still present in a certain mode. It's not present in the way the present moment of instant our consciousness right now is, but its pastness is still haunting us. We're still haunted by the past. So that is maybe a more common thing to say. But I think also we're haunted in a certain way by the future. Um, futurity is not predetermined, but there are different possibilities or potentialities. And the potentialities exist even though exactly how they'll be realized, how they'll become not just potentialities but become actual is not predetermined. It's not just logical possibility in the sense that you could say it's logically possible that I could turn into a dragon 10 minutes from now because there's no violation of logic. I can't see any process turning me into a dragon in the next 10 minutes. So even though that's logically possible, I don't think it's possible in terms of how time actually operates. Meyasu says, uh, le passé est imprévisible, the past is unpredictable. That implies that the past uh, can be changed. Maybe he's a good example when he uh, talks about, like famously by now, about the archifossil. That means fossils that are billions of years old. Uh, they existed in a time that um, um, hasn't been present to itself, that uh, no, one, no one was there to witness these objects or to feel them or to taste them. For Meyasu, that's, uh, that's the beginning of a, of a philosophical um, adventure, uh, or a whole philosophical project to um, develop something like a non-correlationist philosophy. In my company, we are not writing books on finance. We are producing a technology for pricing of derivatives. So it is written in, in the technology itself that we are shipping it to uh, traders. Uh, it's not theory that we are doing, it's, it's practice. So therefore, you have to take into account the meta-theoretical problem. Eight years ago, I started thinking about what could be uh, the meta-probabilistic uh, framework that would, could allow me, at least uh, philosophically speaking, if not mathematically speaking, to frame that paradox. 
Uh, and I found this category of contingency, especially when, for instance, I read the, the book of Quentin, where he says that contingency is something which is uh, bigger and more serious than probability or than the, the, the game of dice. Uh, and I was very, very sensitive, and to me it was, I was struck by it by kind of lightning to the overturning of the ontology that at some point he suggests by saying that we should no longer uh, think of the ontology in terms of the verb to be, uh, which I interpret as to be in, in, in a fixed state, uh, but we have to think of the ontology as the verb can be, meaning uh, can be this or that or can, can not be at all. So I guess there's a kind of a dialectical relationship between um, the, you know, the demands of narrative as being uh, an attempt to make sense of what happens to us, to kind of, to, to, kind of, you know, to wrest some kind of, you know, of meaning or significance from um, contingent happenings and occurrences on the one hand and um, um, and the resistance and, and the way in which the world, time in particular, resists this, uh, you know, this resists narrativization, or there's something about its um, the ways in which events unfold that's, it, it, that is always going to puncture or subvert this kind of um, this narrative demand. There are two kind of uh, levels of the story. One in which the protagonist uh, powers, who's a neurologist who is himself gradually losing consciousness. In other words, he's sleeping for longer and long, longer portions of the day and his, uh, you know, his conscious experience is contracting. Um, at the same time, what's interesting is that this uh, kind of personal narrative is correlated with an account, is correlated with a cosmic condition um, because there's a, an astrophysicist who's a colleague of Powers who is measuring radio signals from distant stars and who claims that actually um, these uh, pulsations are symptoms of the real time or cosmic time and are actually um, you know, kind of signals of the, uh, the diminution of, of cosmic time, that the universe itself is running out of time. Okay. So um, science fiction enables the entire universe to be exhibited from beginning to end. This is my, this is my, uh, this is the, the novel I've um, based a lot of what I'm saying around um, today. Um, it's Stephen Baxter, um, British science fiction writer who has a ridiculously vast imagination and wrote this book, um, The Ring. Um, it features, amongst other things, parts of the early universe, due presumably to overcrowding of the existent parts of it, moving out to occupy, as Paul J. McCauley puts it in his introduction to the novel, um, the yakto seconds immediately following the Big Bang. This becomes a plausible address, as it were, for individuals. Of course, this happens after the fact, but the moving out of communities to occupy some part of the early cosmos turns out to be possible just if the physics of the beings required, or the physics the beings require to survive at that yoktu seconds after the, uh, after the Big Bang, are conditions that are physically meetable at the present time. Nick was the kind of person who would say something like, um, philosophy is just like having a wound and scratching it with a stick. So that kind of thing appealed to me. Um, but also what was exciting is that he was interested precisely in connecting philosophy to culture, to music, to economics, to technology. There's a very interesting dynamic that goes on where it's what I call an interrupted relay. So it becomes a collaboration, but the collaboration is never simultaneous. What happens is an artist will take ideas and will make something that you don't recognize, but that somehow gives you something more to think about. So there's an exchange there which can be very, very positive. Um, but at the same time, there's the whole um, politics of the art, of the contemporary art market, and of the, the kind of appropriations of theory 
which are not always entirely um, a matter of engaging with ideas, but are sometimes more a matter of providing a kind of intellectual jewellery. This is the house that Kulturen developed where the summer school took place. It seems appropriate that the Ashkeva is under construction because the film had to be reconstituted from many different sources spread across the internet. The success of accelerationism, the success of xenofeminism, the success of the film itself spoke to how so many different areas were ready, ready to change uh, away from the kind of narcissism and the sort of victimhood of the politics and the social field in the early 20th century into the new forms, which is so dynamic now, which help us build a route to the 22nd century.